Welcome to Crosstalk Solutions. My name's Chris, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Unify Building Bridge. This is model number UBB-US, and what this is is a Unify-based 60 gigahertz wireless bridge, right? So 60 gigahertz means short range, but really high speeds, right? So you can expect to up to about a gigabit of wireless throughput between a pair of these 60 gigahertz antennas. Okay, so let's go ahead and zoom the camera in close so that we can see what's inside the box. So here is the UBB-US, this is the Unify Building Bridge. This product MSRPs for $499 USD. And what you get here is a pair of antennas uh, that are 60 gigahertz, but they also have a five gigahertz backup, right? So 60 gigahertz is potentially affected by inclement weather, you know, rainstorms, snow, etc. If there are problems with weather and the 60 gigahertz connection is not connecting for whatever reason, the 5 gigahertz backup connection should be fine at these distances, right? Because you're going to have this at a relatively short distance. Uh, the range, the maximum range on 60 gigahertz is up to 500 meters, which is about up to 1,640 feet. So no problem for 5 gigahertz at that range. Uh, you also would want perfectly clear line of sight. This is why they're calling it a building bridge. It's basically meant to bridge two buildings together uh, with gigabit speeds wirelessly. Okay, so this is, doesn't have the really nice Unify packaging. This is sort of more utilitarian packaging. And uh, we are going to go ahead and pop this open here. Okay, so here we can see bridge antenna number one. Comes with a power supply. So this is a 48 volt, or this is a 802.3 AF power supply included, but the building bridge antennas will work off of either 802.3 AF or 48 volt passive, so 48 volt passive uh, PoE. We have the little uh, ball joint mount thing here for the back. We will get that set up soon. Power, uh, power cord for the PoE injector. We have a Jubilee clip or a hose clamp, whatever you want to call it, and another piece of the mounting hardware. And then there's probably an entire another stack of this exact same kit here. So that's exactly right. So here's the second one down here. And the second one's going to get you basically all of this same stuff right here. You know what I don't see is a quick start guide. Usually all of the Ubiquiti stuff has a quick start guide and I do not see one included in this packaging. Nope, I take that back. I found it. It's on the box right here. So there's the QR code for the quick start guide. They do not have it separately uh, as a separate insert inside the box. It's just printed right on the box itself. All right, so this does say that it has an onboard GPS. I'm not sure exactly what that's used for. Typically when we see a GPS in these type of devices, it's if you have multiple of these on like a single tower and they need to do like GPS synchronization between the packet flow of the devices. Uh, it does have a nice little uh, level on the back so you can level it out when you mount it to the pole. That's pretty nice. And then inside here, uh, it's connected so that we don't lose the uh, top, the cover for the ethernet. And basically all we have in here is uh, one ethernet port and one reset port. The mounting bracket is going to go on like so. You take the uh, ball mount portion of it, you stick it through this other sort of screw on piece. And this is basically exactly the same way that they do the um, Nano Beam AC Gen 2s. And you can hear it sort of clicks into place as you tighten it down. So basically you want to loosen it up a little bit. It's like opening a prescription bottle. There's kind of like a thing you have to push in the tab and then screw it back the other way. It's sort of childproof, if you will. Uh, but you can basically loosen it up and then move it around where you need it to on this ball mount. And then once you have it in the right position, you tighten it up like so. All right, so the next thing we need to do is get this connected to Unify. I'm gonna be using my brand new Unify Dream Machine uh, as the Unify controller for this device. And once I have these two connected and speaking with each other, I'm gonna move them outside into my backyard and then we can do some uh, iPerf testing to see what kind of throughput we can get uh, when they're about, you know, it'll be about uh, 30 yards apart. Okay, let's go ahead and get started and get these connected to Unify. So we're a couple days later and originally I was going to try to set up this building to building bridge 
with my unified dream machine and it just didn't seem to work and I'm wondering if the having the building bridge in such a close proximity I've got one here and one here pointed at each other it almost seems like having these in my office is messing with all of the rest of my wireless like maybe these things are screaming so loud at each other or the 5 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz uh, antennas are just I don't know, messing with the rest of my wireless or something. There's been some really odd issues happening. But regardless, we're going to adopt this to my standard uh, Cloud Key Gen 2 that's sitting right back over here. So here I am in Unify. Here's the building bridge. Uh, Link is currently inactive, which is interesting because even prior to pending adoption, I have had this link active where it was working. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and say adopt. Uh, there also might be another problem. When I had it on the Unified Dream Machine, I was able to, oh, now they both turn blue, or at least this side turned blue. So this side is blue, this side is, oh, is now also blue. Okay, so it looks like that worked, and now they are connected. But what I was going to say is that when I had it on the Unified Dream Machine, I was able to update the firmware on one of the devices, but never on the second one. So I do need to still update firmware on one of the two devices, but other than that, it looks like it is adopting successfully here. So when one of the devices goes offline, the LED turns red. You can see it right here. So this one's red currently. This one's blue. I think it's just going through the adoption process. Uh, or maybe, again, I might have to update the firmware on my second device before they'll actually start communicating again. I do like, though, that the, the LED ring turns red. I think that's pretty cool because um, it lets you know just immediately, hey, there's a problem. This is red. I also don't know if this is just in my head, but with these devices so close to each other and just sort of basically sending their signal through me, I, I again, I, this is probably just in my head, but I feel like I can feel the 60 gigahertz connection. Like I feel like a weird sort of tickle at the top of my brain. I, hopefully it's not giving me cancer or something, uh, but I want to get these things moved outside as quickly as I can because, man, it just seems to be messing with all of my internal wireless. It seems to be messing with my brain a little bit, I gotta get these things outside. I've done research on wireless signals and their effect on the human body and there's never been anything that shows there is any effect with uh, at least with 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz on the human body so again hopefully I'm not you know blasting out my brain at the moment. Alright so that just finished and let's go ahead back to our devices here we can see the building to building bridge. Uh, is it connected? Oh, it is connected. So we've got 97 out of 100 link quality. We are connected. Uh, but again, I do have one of the devices that still needs to be upgraded, and it is the access point side. So we're going to go ahead and upgrade that now. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move these outside so that we can actually start doing some testing, put a little bit of distance between the two, and uh, you know get it out of my office where it's messing with all my other wireless stuff. And uh, yeah, then we'll do some iPerf testing and see how much speed we can uh, pump through this building to building bridge. All right, so hooking up the access point side here, we're gonna put it right on this pole and then screw it in. So environmentally, these things can withstand temperatures of minus 40 up to 70 degrees Celsius, which is actually uh, minus 40 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are pretty rugged as far as being able to tackle the weather. Uh, they also have a wind survivability of 125 miles an hour, or uh, that's also 200 kilometers per hour uh, on the wind survivability. All right, so there we go, attached to the pole. And then of course it also has a little level in the back so that you can level it and position it exactly the right way. The building to building bridge is now in place. You can see it outside my window here. Here is the access point, and then right over there, about nine meters away, is the station side. So let's take a look at this device in Unify. There really isn't all that much to it. So if we click on the building bridge, we can see our link quality. Right now we're at 100 out of 100. Uh, we can see the uptime, the distance, and the link speed as well as the quality and capacity. Now the capacity says 1.75 gigabits per second, but uh, I don't think we would, I, I wouldn't expect to see anywhere near 1.75 gigabits per second. Their speed estimations are often a little bit um, ambitious, I guess you could say. So sometimes they will do a 
a capacity of 1.75 gigabits per second, but that doesn't take into effect that it's not full duplex, right? So it's like two sides of a half duplex connection, stuff like that. So I would never expect to get full 1.75 gigabit, not to mention that the Ethernet interfaces on those devices are only gigabit, so that should be about the max that you would expect to see, even if the capacity between the two is greater than one point, uh, than greater than one gigabit. Okay, so if you click on an individual access point or station, we do get a little bit more data. We can see the MAC address, model number, version, IP address, and then we can click on wired uplink. This tells us about the Ethernet interface, in this case, full duplex a gigabit. Uh, downlinks, we have one downlink that is the station side of the point-to-point -point bridge. And then we have our uh, stats for the 5 gigahertz radio as well as the 60 gigahertz radio. If we click on config, we can set the name of the device, so right now it's just the MAC address. Uh, then we can use, we can change the LED, so this is really interesting. Remember how I said earlier in the video how I thought it was cool that it was a red LED when something was wrong? They have actually built in that you can make the LED on this thing any color you want, so when it's connected. So I could click yellow and hit save, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but this LED right out here should turn yellow in just a second. Boom, there it goes. So now you can see the LED ring is yellow. Let's try a different color, let's try pink and save that. Now, so it's yellow right now, you'll see it change to pink in just a second. There it goes, so there it goes. Now it's pink. And uh, yeah, so you can change the LED ring to whatever color you want, uh, which is useful, I guess, maybe not so useful, <laughs> but I still think it's pretty cool. Uh, you can set it to, like I said, any color in the spectrum. Uh, down here under radios, we can manually set our channel settings. So we can set our 5 gigahertz channel, the channel width, which is, uh, it looks like 80 gigahertz by default. Actually, it doesn't look like you could set the channel width. So the 5 gigahertz backup radio, you can set the channel manually, but it doesn't look like you can actually set the transmit power or the channel width on that. Maybe if you take it off of here? No, so you still can't do that. So we're just going to leave that on auto. And then down here on the 60 gigahertz, you can change the channel width. So HT1080, HT2160, I don't know enough about the channel widths in 60 gigahertz to know if that's going to make a huge difference. Maybe we will try the tests at uh, 1080 and then bump it to... 2160 and see if that makes any sort of difference. Alright, so let's go ahead and cue those changes. I don't think I actually made any changes, but we'll just make sure that our changes are applied. There are a couple of other tabs here. The Tools tab just shows you a debug terminal. And then of course we have statistics uh, for the device. Alright, so let's go ahead and run some tests. Now, I have a couple of tests here. So this is a, the way that I have this set up is I have my network, my computer plugged into the closer access point, the one that's right here on this pole. And then that shoots over to the other side, about nine meters away to the other side station, which is then wired directly into a Linux computer on this side, right? So there's no switch, there's nothing in the way, it's just literally a cable coming out of the station side directly into a Pop! OS server that I have running. So this is the Pop! OS server. We have iPerf running on 5201 in server mode. Let's bring up uh, this side here, oh, this is also server mode. All right, we'll bring up our command prompt, and we're going to do uh, iperf3-c, and then the IP address of the Linux box running in server mode. Let's go ahead and do that now. And there we go. So you can see in that mode, we got just about 500 megabits per second across the wireless link. Let's try it going the other direction. So here I now have my computer listening in server mode, and so this is the bottom two screens here. My computer's over here listening in server mode, and then we're going to run iperf-c uh, over from the Linux box over to my computer. Now there's a little bit of overhead because I have terminal sessions open to the Linux box, but I mean that's not going to take away from, you know, a half a gigabit connection. Alright, so going the other direction, it looks like we have about 550 to 575 megabits per second. Uh, go in the other direction. So about 500 in one direction, about 560 the other direction. That's pretty good. So imagine that you just bought this thing and you had a you know 10 meter bridge or gap that you needed to bridge. You put both of these up on each side and now you've got a half a gigabit connection between your two buildings or your you know point A and point B. That's pretty good for just getting it in the box all pre-configured and ready to go. Let's try another test. So I have 
two servers. So I've got my Linux running in server mode. I've got my desktop here running in server mode. Let's run both tests simultaneously. So we're going to say, get this ready. And we're just going to say, enter and enter. Oops. Enter. All right, so now they're running at the same time. Oh, I screwed that up. Let me start it over. All right, enter and enter. All right, so both of these tests running at the same time, and we're getting about Looks like 350 to 400 megabits with both tests running simultaneously. So I guess in total, we're looking at about 750 megabits per second if you combine those two tests together. So yeah, again, not so bad. Let's try changing the channel width on, the, on both sides here. We're gonna do the station side first. You always wanna do the remote side first and then we'll come back and we'll do the local side. Oh, on the station side, you don't have the option. You could change the LED, but you don't have the option of setting the channel width on the station side at all. That's interesting. All right, so we'll go to the access point. We'll set channel width on the access point. Let's set our channel width to HT2160 HT and cue those changes and apply. All right, so interesting. So we're done provisioning and my link quality dropped down to 66 out of 100. And the link capacity dropped down to 1.17 gigabit per second. Interesting. So the change in channel width looks like it affected this thing negatively. Let's go ahead and run our speed tests. All right, so there we go. iPerf is still showing right around 550 megabits per second. So it doesn't look like the change to channel width affected the speed at all, uh, but it did affect the what it's actually showing in Unify as far as link quality. So I'm gonna set this back to the standard channel width and then I guess we're going to call it a day. So what do you guys think about this device? If you have any questions about this 60 gigahertz Unify building bridge, put those down in the comments below. I'll try to get them answered. Uh, I'll either respond to the comment or I will do a follow-up video if there are enough questions about this device. So overall, I think it's a good device. The price, I think, is a little steep. So $500 for this set is okay. But again, you've got the Microtik wireless wire, which is significantly cheaper than that. I think it's about $200 for the wireless wire. The advantage that you get for the extra 300 bucks, it looks cooler. It integrates with Unify very, very easily. So that's nice. Um, it is literally a take it out of the box and it works type of product. So there is something to be said for that. Again, the Microtik is also the same sort of thing, take it out of the box and it works. So uh, yeah, I think the price is a little steep. I do like the device. You know, changing the color on the LED is cool, but totally unnecessary. And uh, yeah, what do you guys think? Put your uh, comments down below and I'd be happy to take a look at those. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you give me a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, click that subscribe button. My name is Chris with Crosstalk Solutions, and thank you so much for watching.